I'm going to be extending the lecture that I gave uh, the last two years, so that's why I've titled it Sleep Disorders 202, presuming you, you came to 101. And I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the practical aspects of how, what do I do with my patients? Now that I had this idea that we can fix sleep disorders by mostly giving them vitamin D and then using CPAP, how do I interview them, what do I do? So this is about how do we tell if I have a sleep disorder, how do I tell if my patient has a sleep disorder, and then what do we do about it? So the first thing that most of you that have been in here before know is sleep apnea is not because you're fat. People get fat because they have sleep apnea, but they don't get sleep apnea because they're fat. And it's true that if you lose weight, the apnea gets better, but that's really not the whole story. And there are many, many people with sleep disorders who also don't have sleep apnea. And it is actually pretty normal to have sleep disorders now. Probably, depending on the age you look at, at least half of the population has a sleep disorder of some kind. And this is why you see so many medications advertised on television. The drug companies only make drugs for things that they can sell in large numbers. But that also means a lot of people have to take medications because they're not restoring their body in sleep. And unfortunately, it's happening to our children in even a higher percentage. So the first set of questions are, how do I tell if I have a sleep disorder or my patient has a sleep disorder? And the first question I always ask is, how's your sleep? But then the thing you have to know, and you'll only really garner this from being with your patients a long time and asking them a lot of questions about their sleep is, most people think it's normal to get up two or three times to, to urinate now. And we, we have all these answers for them. Oh, it's your prostate. Oh, your bladder's fallen. But in actual fact, humans were not made to get up two or three times to go to the bathroom. In fact, if you were sleeping under a tree somewhere and you got up to go pee, nobody may see you again because the lions will jump on you and eat you. So it's only with internal plumbing and a safer environment we're all protected that it was okay to get up to go to the bathroom. So it turns out that when you ask your patient, how's your sleep, and they say, oh, it's fine, and they uh, are seeing you because they have several other medical problems, you really do need to ask some other questions because they may not know that their sleep is not normal. All we really know are the people around us and what we've been told on the internet as to what's normal about sleep. So these are the other questions I ask. What, what time do you lay down? What time do you fall asleep? How long does it take you to fall asleep? How many times do you wake up during the, sleep, during the night? It's interesting to me that anybody who wakes up during the night always has a little legend as to why. It'll be their poodle that has to go out to urinate in the middle of the night or they have to get up to pee. Uh, most of the time there's a yes but. And a lot of people who have chronic pain feel that their pain wakes them. And I'll try to convince you that it's really that they have a sleep disorder and that's why they have pain. Uh, cramping in the middle of the night turns out to be quote-unquote normal in some people, but it also means that your legs are moving a little bit too much. And the next question is, do you fall back to sleep right away or do you spend another hour lying awake thinking about things? Do people say that you snore? Do people not want to sleep with you because you kick? These are all things that are not really normal. And a lot of the patients will say, yeah, I sleep fine. In fact, I'm a really good sleeper. If you ask them, do you sleep more than you think you should, it turns out some people are sleeping 12 or 13 hours in order to be able to get to work or get to school. 13 hours takes away a lot from your day and that turns out to be a sleep disorder as well. So the next set of questions are about how do you feel in the morning? So most people that you ask, oh, do you wake up with any pain in the morning? That was a really interesting learning experience for me because almost always the patient will say, yes, but I have a herniated disc at L23. I have a bone spur at C5. And I, and I was, at the beginning I, was, I thought, how do they know that stuff? Well, as soon as somebody comes with pain to their doctor in the last 30 to 40 years, our habit is we take a picture. We can look inside your body now. So I take a picture, I give you the picture, and I say, it's a herniated disc at L3-4. Basically that means, shut up, it's your fault, it's not my fault, and it's your body. It's your body forsaking you. And it turns out that that's not exactly true. 
It turns out that our body is made to be healing itself in sleep. And if you still have pain and you didn't just fall down the stairs or you didn't get hit by a car yesterday, your body really ought to be healing you. So it's interesting to me that we in medicine have moved towards what is effectively blaming the patient for their pain instead of fixing it. There's also a, better, uh, a set of questions about whether or not you take naps. Most of us were able to take naps as children, but often as we get to be adults, we can't. People who have normal brain chemistry actually can take a nap, and they can fall asleep, wake up, and they feel better. A lot of people that I see can't sleep, and then when they do sleep, they actually feel worse. The next question to ask, because they won't necessarily tell you, is whether or not they sleep in a chair or on a couch. A lot of my patients wind up sleeping in their recliner now. And that, I don't think, is a bad thing, but it tells you a lot. It tells you that they're sleeping in a recliner, and it's usually not because they have too many people living in the house. It's because they sleep better in the recliner. That will tell you that when they sleep in the bed, their airway collapses. So it's a pretty good uh, sign that they have sleep apnea. The next one is, and we'll talk at length about this in a minute, do you see, does your spouse see you falling asleep in a chair in the afternoon? Do you fall asleep every time you sit down? Those are things that the patient will say, oh yeah, I sleep great, I can sleep anywhere. Anytime I sit down, I can fall asleep. Well, that is not actually a healthy thing. That means you're tired during the day and the sleep that you get at night is not as restorative as it should be. And also, do you work night shifts or swing, swing shifts? All the nurses in this room know that it's really not normal for human beings to work nights. We, we never did. We're like chickens. We go find our little place to hide as soon as the sun goes down. We don't see well at night. We're not night hunters. That means that those of us who have to work night shift are very stressed by this. We age faster than the people around us, especially if we can't make up to sleep during the day, which turns out to be pretty difficult. The more complicated questions that you'll ask less, but I end up asking are, do you act out your dreams? Does your wife say that you are reaching while you're asleep, while you're in the chair? Do you talk during your sleep? Even though we think it's, it's comedic that kids sleepwalk and sleep talk, it turns out that those people that sleepwalked and sleep talked as a child probably have an increased incidence of their sleep switch, the, the part that was supposed to keep them normally paralyzed. As soon as you see someone sleepwalking, you immediately realize the danger of that. They can walk out the door, they can climb out the window. That is not a normal brain stem. As soon as they are actually able to get up and walk or talk and not remember and they're not on Ambien, those people are having a malfunction of the part of their brainstem that allows them to get paralyzed normally. I see those people later on in life doing things that are very unusual. So I wonder that they don't have a genetic problem that makes their sleep switch or the, the nucleus that keeps them paralyzed a little bit funny at the beginning. They usually will be children that are vitamin D deficient also. And do you, have you ever had a sleep study? It's funny to me that all the patients who come to see me, they somehow just neglect to mention, you know, I'm asking them about their sleep. Somehow they don't really come up with the idea that, oh yeah, three years ago my doctor sent me for a sleep study. Well, what did they tell you about it? Oh, I have sleep apnea. Oh, are you wearing that mask? No. no. And so that information is there for you if you're interested in it. And then you can, you can glean a lot of information from the sleep <laughs> studies that are done, even if they don't have sleep apnea. And one of the really interesting things is, if I'm sitting in my office interviewing a patient and I fall asleep while I'm writing stuff down, which was not uncommon for me six or seven years ago after lunch, I'm not going to think it's weird for them to fall asleep after lunch at their desk either. So as more and more of us have sleep disorders, we think it's normal for people to have normal, abnormal sleep because we do too. So normal people, and I'm telling you this based on what I see and patients who I now know have as normal brain chemistry as I can make it, and I now have several patients who have been sleeping during the day. They don't know why, they can't sleep at night. This is the worst sleep disorder you can have, barring the person who has horrible sleep apnea. They've slept during the day for 20 years, and it turns out if you can get their chemistry right, slowly over a period of months, even when you don't yell at them or tell them to change, they will slowly get back to the same schedule as everyone else. And it turns out that every human on the planet goes to sleep about the same time. They go to bed at 9.30 or 10. People who live in rural environments where they don't have any electricity go to bed earlier, but they may not fall asleep until 8.39, and they wake up when the sun comes up. Well, 
that's actually the way it's always been. City dwellers used to make fun of the rural people because they would go to bed like the chickens when the sun went down, but that's really the way humans are set up to work. Well, that also means that our sleep period is going to be longer in the winter than it is in the summer. And that's really the, the way we're designed to be. So those of us who live in, in uh, cities usually spend about the same amount of time. And most of us, since I spend all my time asking what time do you go to bed, most people go to bed sometime, sometime between 9.30 and 11. And then they wake up at 6.30 or 7. And normal people have no pain on awakening. They do not get up to go to the bathroom. They do not wake up and eat. And uh, they don't stay awake in the middle of the night thinking about things. And again, this is the same sort of thing where everybody has a little legend about, oh, I have a lot of stress. I wake up at 3 a.m. and I stay awake for an hour thinking about my grandkids, my cousin, our bills. The idea that we're stressed and therefore we wake up in the middle of the night is an, is, makes perfect sense. But the problem is, really what you're supposed to be doing is you're supposed to be in REM sleep. That's where you process all that stress that you have. I tell my patients a story about how every animal on this planet has a very stressful life. The squirrels that live in my backyard have to watch Uncle Harry fall out of the tree and get horribly mangled by my dogs. They throw him up in the air and he screams and it's, it's horrifying. I mean, think about that. Every day you, you wake up and you, the, you have these horrible killers living below you. I mean, we walk out of our house and we feel relatively safe. That means those animals have to be able to do something with that fear so that they still want to get up in the morning and then heckle my dogs and get up there and, 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 and get back at them. So they're in a good mood and they're, they're not terrified enough to find another place to live. They'll hang out there. Humans and every other animal processes the stressors, the fears that they experience every day by getting into REM sleep. That means when you're awake from three to four, you you're thinking about it, but you're really not processing it the way you're supposed to be. It's not normal to stay awake for an hour in the middle of the night. We've taught each other that elderly people don't need as much sleep, and that's a lie. It turns out as soon as they stop sleeping normally, they start to age. So as long as we don't get hit by a bus, we will actually sleep worse as we get older. And I'll talk to you a little bit about why that is almost always the case. And people that I see who are 25 years old can wake up in the morning and feel old. And many of my patients who have daily headache also have stiffness of their spine and they get up and kind of hobble around in the morning. So that means that feeling old isn't necessarily related to your, the number. It's related to how you, how you feel because of how you slept. The one group of patients that I end up seeing that don't have sleep disorders that I think is very interesting are the, the pure Alzheimer's patients where there is, a, there is a group that winds up with a neurologist who sleep great. They look perky, they look wonderful. And now I, I look at people and I, can, you know, I, I internalize whether or not they look sleepy or tired or miserable, and many of the Alzheimer's patients don't appear to have any sleep disorder. Often they'll come into the office with no medicines either. They're taking an aspirin a day, but they're 75 and they're really not on the same group of medicines that we're used to seeing, something for hypertension, for something for high cholesterol. All the things that we think are routine medicines usually start to come over a five to six year period in the older patients because their sleep is going bad. What about sleeping in a chair or sleeping on the couch? I think that uh, humans lie down because they get paralyzed. Most, patient, most animals lay down. Horses stand up and birds have to hold onto their little sticks, but most of us lie down because we get paralyzed. Now, most people don't want to sleep in a chair. In fact, the idea of sleeping in a chair is pretty, sounds like it would make me uncomfortable, but the patients who do sleep in a chair are telling you, usually, I feel better when I sleep in my chair. I don't have as much pain when I sleep in my chair. That's a very important thing that'll teach you that they get apneic when they try to lay down flat. And I've actually had patients who I started on CPAP devices six years ago who slowly moved from being in the bed with the CPAP, then they had to move to the chair with the CPAP, then they had to move to BiPAP. That's a very important thing. That was one of the things that made me so frustrated. If I'm using these masks, how come they're not cured? How come they're continuing uh, to get worse? And there's something about sleeping on the couch, too, that keeps people on their side that also makes them be able to breathe better. Many of the patients who I see have been looking for a new mattress. Oh, my wife and I got a new mattress. I thought it would really help me, and my back still hurts. It's not the mattress. Now, what if my patient says my sleep is fine? 
Now, first case is their sleep really is fine. They don't have any medical problems. They're coming in because you're a family practitioner or an internist and they're 45 years old and they were told they should have a normal, healthy visit to the doctor because there's really nothing wrong with them and they haven't seen the doctor. That person probably does have normal sleep. There's nothing wrong with them. But the person who says, I sleep fine or I think my sleep is normal and they have one of the diseases that we see all the time that we list in the patients who we end up admitting to the hospital in a little list, hypertension, heart disease, blah, 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 they always have the same list. Those people, guaranteed, they do not sleep normally. They may not realize that they're not sleeping normally, but they're not. And can you have abnormal sleep and not really know it? So the majority of the patients I started this with were headache patients. And the odd part is that there still haven't been good publications about the fact that daily headache sufferers all have sleep disorders. Most of them have a lack of REM sleep and until stumbling into this vitamin D stuff, nobody was really writing about that. Nobody's really asked 32 year old women who have three kids if they can sleep or not. We just assume that they don't sleep, they have three little kids and they work. So yeah, they're tired. So because nobody had done sleep studies in them, they didn't listen to whether or not they were tired. And when I began to ask them, how do you feel, how do you sleep, it's pretty consistent that they don't sleep well, they don't feel good when they wake up. Now, there were a few of those women that would say, I sleep fine. And then I would do a sleep study if they would let me, and their sleep study would be just as bad as the others. And then I would go back and say, do you really sleep fine? Well, it turns out that they often say, I sleep the same way I always have. Terribly. You know, I wake up and I'm tired. I sleep, but I'm tired. So the person who's never had normal sleep, and because I see little kids with headaches, they always have abnormal sleep. Now they say, my sleep is fine if you ask them, but if you ask their mom how many times she has to get them up in order to get him to go to school in the morning, she'll tell you, Jeremy, I have to sit him on, I have to stand him on his, on his feet because he'll go back to sleep if I don't. I have to go in there three times. Those kids are telling you they really didn't complete their deep phases of sleep. But that child, that's the only body that child's ever had. They don't know what it's like to sleep normally. They sleep only as their body sleeps. Those people can grow up and be in your practice and still not sleep normally. Then there's a second group that is a clinical observation. I'm not sure what it means, and I'm gonna tell you what I think it means. Um, that frequently tells me that they they sleep fine, that's the Parkinson's patients. About five years ago, before I got into the vitamin D stuff, and I was still doing a lot of sleep studies, Dr. Plotkin came in and said, oh, have you read that literature about the Parkinson's patients? And it turns out by the time the patient walks into your office with recognizable Parkinson's disease, they have a very abnormal sleep study. And what they had were studies that showed that if you had a sleep study by coincidence 20 years prior on the person with a tremor and an abnormal gait, their sleep studies are very abnormal 20 years before they ever have any motor signs of Parkinson's disease. Now the hard part was I knew they had sleep disorders and I wanted to send them for sleep studies and consistently they were the only group that said, nope, I'm not going. And I would say, well, you have a sleep disorder. No, no I don't. I feel fine. And after they kept saying that to me, I feel fine, I, sleep, I feel fine, I thought, they must feel fine. You know, that, that's what they're saying. Isn't that weird? How come they don't feel tired? Well, the wife, if she comes on the third visit, will say, if you're not tired, why do you fall asleep right after breakfast? That's a very, very interesting thing. They fall asleep and then they wake right up. And then the weirdest part was a couple of patients would say, you fall asleep right after breakfast. And he'd say, I do not. And they would argue about it. And that's very odd. Most people know when they fall asleep. And what I'll tell you what I think is they don't get the drowsy phase. Their sleep pattern is so goofed up that they don't have a drowsy warning. It turns out that drowsiness is not sleep. Drowsiness is a warning. You're about to have a loss of consciousness. It would be nice if you were lying down in your little nest. If you don't get that, then if you're sitting, then you just fall asleep. I have patients who are walking down the street and fall asleep. Very dangerous. They fall down, they break their neck, they come in the emergency room. We do all these studies on them to make sure they're not having seizures. They just fell into deep sleep without a warning. Very, very bad thing to have happen to you. You have to have very, very abnormal sleep for that to happen. So I suspect that the Parkinson's patients have 
a couple of things. I suspect that opposite to the little kid who's drowsy all the time, they don't have enough dopamine hanging around when they open their eyes in the morning that they feel tired. I, I'm theorizing that. If you have less dopamine, and dopamine is one of the things that makes you very sleepy and continues your sleep phase, you may wake up and feel quite alert and awake. Oddly enough, right after breakfast, you'll fall asleep again. So asking about these things and taking in consideration that the person is there because they have a tremor and their walking is a little funny, even if they don't look flagrantly Parkinsonian, that can still tell you, gee, maybe I should ask a few more questions and maybe I shouldn't stop with just, oh, do you wake up in a good mood? Do you feel good when you wake up? There may be some other things that I need to pay attention to. Because dopamine, um, play such a large role, I look for it all the time now. And, and because of that, I ask a lot of questions about family history. Um, so anybody who is coming to see me for daily headache that started at age 55, I'm very interested in whether or not they have a family member with Parkinson's disease. Because I can tell the first day I walk in, the first minute I walk in the room that they don't have Parkinson's disease but perhaps they have a genetic tendency. We don't really know what causes Parkinson's disease and whether or not it's really a genetic disorder or not. However, it certainly looks like it runs in families and a lot. So anybody who has a tremor history in the family, even if they don't have a tremor themselves, I'm thinking about the possibility that they have a dopamine deficiency also. It turns out I don't treat them any differently, but it makes me listen to what they, they tell me about their sleep in a slightly different way. It's very interesting to me that when I ask about the mom's history and I say, did anyone in your family have a tremor as they got older? No. Did anybody have trouble with their walking as they got older? No. Is your mom still alive? Yeah, she's in a nursing home. Oh? Does she have any trouble with her walking? Well, yeah, she's using a walker now. How long has she been using a walker? About three years, but you know, she has bad knees. Well, she has bad knees because her knees are not repairing because they're moving in sleep because she has a sleep disorder. Now she may have a sleep disorder of just an elderly person but she may also have Parkinson's disease. People wind up going to nursing homes basically for two reasons. They lose their memory or they fall down all the time. So one of those two things is going to be in the background for a lot of our elderly patients. Many of them may have problems with their, park, their dopamine system. We don't really even know if that means that they have Parkinson's disease. We could all perhaps develop problems with our dopamine as we get older. Nobody really knows about that at this time. And the patient that I'm seeing, uh-oh, he's in there because he has knee pain. Well, gee, he's not in a walker yet, but that, it's relevant that his mom is now using a walker and has her knees replaced. I think that it's really important that we all know about the fact that if we have to work nights, that increases your risk of the horrid diseases that I see every weekend that I'm on call. So the patients that I see in the hospital who have a stroke usually have a vitamin D level below 20. doesn't matter what age they are, whether they've bled or whether or not they've had an ischemic stroke, the D is almost always below 20. But it's interesting that several of the patients that I see will have vitamin D levels that are a little bit better than that and frequently they will have a little touch of Parkinsonism or they'll be younger and they'll, they'll work night shift. So what it looks to me like sleep deprivation and sleep interruption, and this is what the sleep disorders experts are publishing also, it doesn't matter if you have sleep apnea. If you have interrupted sleep because you have to get up to care for your elderly spouse or your elderly mom and they're demented and getting up four times a night, that's why after they die, that person comes in with a heart attack within the two months after they stop caring for their mom. They just went two years with very interrupted sleep as a caregiver doesn't matter why your sleep is interrupted. What that means to me is, if I can get the D-level more perfect so that you can lay down in the afternoon and make up two hours of REM in the afternoon, that's going to be a really important thing for anybody who has to stay up at night because of their circumstances. Can this happen to our babies and our children? You bet. It turns out the autism is on the rise in all the developed countries. It's interesting that when I was in training, the moms would come in and say, why does my baby sleep so much? Not, not very many people do that anymore. In fact, the pediatricians who've been trained in the last 30 years don't know that it's not normal for babies to wake up the way they do now. And they say, oh, 
They have colic. They get up five times a night and cry all night long. That's a treatable illness. And that is really a tragedy because it turns out that our babies are born with an undeveloped brain. They're not able to walk or talk. They're not, you know, driving the car as soon as they pop out. That means 10 years, maybe longer, for the brain to develop. We only develop it while we're sleeping. While we're awake, we're using it. That idea is my idea. I don't see that written anywhere, but it, most lay people have no problem with that idea. We're doing things with the brain while we're sleeping. That means your baby, in order to develop normally, needs to sleep. This is one of the things that happened to one of my friends when I first started getting into this. Her baby did not sleep for the entire second month of his life. She had her mother-in-law and her mother there, and they would take shifts. And he didn't sleep at all. He cried 24 hours a day. And not only was the baby distraught, but the, you know, everybody else was distraught. And of course, even though it was July, they didn't take the kid outside because he was screaming the whole time. And I happen to know that she was D deficient because she hadn't been able to get pregnant for 15 years and had a very difficult time with her pregnancy. And it, I was just starting to get into vitamin D and it's a very scary chemical, so I'm not giving anybody advice on their kids at that time. But these are things that can be easily treated. And it turns out that the American Society of Pediatricians recommends a daily dose for any baby who is even partially breastfed. That dose, ironically, is the same dose we give to pregnant moms, which makes absolutely no sense. I'll explain a little bit about why that is, but 400 international units a day for a, new, for a newborn is a perfect dose. Most of the time they'll do great, and you can tell if your baby has the right D level because they sleep through the night. They wake up, they cry a little bit, they go to the breast, they fall asleep while they're nursing, and you put them down and mom falls asleep too. That's, that's the ideal, that's where you'd like to get to. There's a whole body of literature about autism in, in certain areas of the country that's called, for instance, the Somali disease. All the Somalians moved to Detroit, and within about 10 years, the incidence of autism in their children was much, much higher than in the native place where they were living before. They just moved from a very high sun environment that their skin is adapted to, to a very low sun environment in Detroit. This is a tragedy because after 10 or 15 years, it's quite likely we can't reverse that process. The development was never normal. So what about pregnant moms? This is what I hear all the time from my moms that are vitamin D deficient. You can't sleep because you're pregnant. You're cranky and you can't think because you're pregnant. Your legs are swollen because you're pregnant. Your back hurts because you're pregnant. You have reflux because you're pregnant. So mom's need efficient. She has a difficult pregnancy. My grandbaby born two months early. Why are we so good at neonatology? Because women in this country can't carry their babies to term. That's why we've gotten so good at it. If none of the babies were being born at 27 weeks, we wouldn't have to get good at it. If you get the D vitamin up to where it needs to be, they sleep well, and there's a huge area of literature about what the vitamin D does in the placenta. How, do we, how does it play a role in the immune system's ability to recognize that this baby, we want to keep this baby? Yes, it's a foreign invader, but why is it that we want to keep this foreign invader inside our body for nine months? So pregnant moms really need a lot bigger doses and they need to have their levels done all the time. And I've had two teenagers. Unfortunately, this vitamin D stuff, when it makes your sleep better, it makes the entire endocrine system better. And it also makes the body say, yeah, let's have a baby. So I've had two pregnant teenagers who had complained that they had sex only once. So one of the things I always tell the women who are young and in childbearing ages, you better be using birth control if you don't want another baby because as soon as you sleep well, your body goes into time to make a baby. Let's make that baby. So this is one of the things that you should warn your patients as you're helping them get their sleep better. They'll actually lead a better life, but they're also likely to reproduce a little bit more. Pregnant women, and those two teenagers, by the way, who I actually did get to come in and see and get their vitamin D levels done regularly, looked beautiful. Came in at nine months no weight gain, felt fantastic, slept well. It really is a, an amazing thing to see a pregnant woman who's not uncomfortable at nine months. It's a beautiful thing. What about our kids? Well, they don't hurt. The ones that sleep well don't hurt. They're not cranky. They don't have a runny nose. 
even in February, March, and April, when everybody's kids start to have a runny nose every day. And we do have viral infections, but there's a reason why they come in the winter, and it's partially due to the fact that we all start running out of the vitamin D that we made in the summer. We don't sleep as well, our immune system is affected by that, and we, we're more likely to get runny noses and viral infections. This is what they should look like. They're not tired. And oddly enough, one of my patients came and said, you know, you're doing this with Jeremy so he doesn't have headaches, but you know what's weird? He stopped wet in the bed. And for the first time I thought, I don't know why that didn't occur to me, but Jeremy's not getting into, into the right phases of sleep. And it turns out that we release antidiuretic hormone only when we get into deep sleep. So all the elderly males that get up to pee every hour, you put a CPAP mask on, your fa on their face, you give them a sleep medicine, they can sleep eight hours and they don't wet the bed. When they make antidiuretic hormone, which was designed to turn off the kidney so he wouldn't make too much urine and have to get up, if you make it properly, you can actually sleep through the night. So the little kids have a very, very strong pressure because they're growing and they're learning to stay in deep sleep and not wake up. And I suspect that that's why they stay asleep and wet the bed instead of getting up the way that the adults do. You see a very interesting change at about age 13, 14. So the questions I ask for the little kids are usually directed towards the mom. So how many times do you have to get Jeremy out of bed to go to school in the morning is what I do with the kids up until about 12 or 13. And then as they transition into teens, they start having trouble falling asleep. So there's something different about the brain chemistry. There's the, the brain is doing something slightly different after we go through puberty that leads to the questions being a little bit different. You can go on to, uh, I'll give you this in the next slide, the Vitamin D Council is one of the really good sources for all the children diseases. All the kids that happen in, all the, sorry, all the diseases that happen in children are well described there. And then the, the four big ones are asthma, allergy, ADD, and autism. So one of the important concepts that I want you to think about, and we're going to talk about it uh, a lot more in just in a minute about hypertension is, while we're sleeping, we make these chemicals and then we wake up and uh-oh, my kid's running all over the place, standing on the table and he won't sit down and learn. What do we end up giving him? We end up giving him stimulants. Well, it turns out if you get their sleep better, you don't have to give them stimulants. So there is somewhat of a logic to think, oh, those stimulants are sitting on receptors. Hmm, those receptors are there already. That means every drug I give to these kids or adults there's a receptor there that that drug goes to. Well, maybe the kid isn't making their own stimulants. If they make their own stimulants, and we don't have to give them that. So we learn things about how the brain works based on the drug that works. But wouldn't it be better if they made their own? If they can make their own tailor-made drugs that work better in their brain. So it turns out that there are measures, without doing the vitamin D level, of whether or not your child is sleeping well. If you wake up in the morning at 6.30 and there's your four-year-old staring at you, not poking you in the nose, not throwing things, not screaming, just standing there and you open your eyes and he goes, hi mommy, then you know, wow, this is amazing. This kid woke up before I did, walked in here and didn't cause a, a t terrible mess. That child is in a good mood, playful, happy, not whining and cranky. It's, it's amazing to me that so many of kids, even, our, even child stars now in movies, as soon as they have these dark circles under their eyes on the movie, I think, oh, that's so terrible. That poor kid looks so sleep deprived. We now think of it as normal, and it's, it's really not fair to our children. Now I'm going to switch gears, and I'm going to talk about adults, and I'm going to tell you about just my view of how we should see the chronic illnesses that all of us in this room take care of all the time. It's a very different way to think about it. It's my theory. And I'm going to give it to you as one of the diseases that we all see all the time, hypertension. Now, I'm, I'm going to make up stories about it to have you think about it in a different way, OK? We know, starting in the 90s, that the sleep disorders experts started to write Every American with hypertension has a sleep disorder. Now, what's the weird part about that? Those people are not getting sleep studies, most of them. We were still waiting for them to get fat and have a fat neck. Well, I know because I sent a lot of people 
who were relatively normal, healthy females to sleep studies for headache, that what you're going to see most of the time, if it's very early in the disease, you won't see sleep apnea. You might see some REM-related apnea. So they may have half an hour of REM, eight apneic episodes, but the front of the report will come back to you saying no significant apnea. What they did was they took eight apneic spells, eight hours, ah, once an hour, no big deal. Well, that person only had a half an hour of REM out of the eight hours they slept, and then they interrupted it like every five minutes. That, that has to be hard on the person. That means, yes, there will be a sleep disorder in the background, but we haven't had any way to deal with it. If there's no apnea, what are you going to do? Give them a sleeping medicine? What if they're already sleeping eight hours? There, is, there are no medicines that give back REM. That means even though these experts started telling us that, the only option for the internist really is, oh, I can't send you for a sleep study because you're really not sick enough, let's give you a pill, okay? What if I open the opportunity to look at that in a different way and say, gee, what if I could fix their sleep? What, what if we could figure out what was wrong with their sleep and fix that? How would I view hypertension then? Okay, now, we think of hypertension as a disease. As long as I've been, since I've been in medicine, we think of it as a separate disease, like, we don't think of it as an autonomic disorder, or at least I haven't been trained to think that way. Yet the patient with low blood pressure, they stand up and their blood pressure is too low, is sent to the neurologist for autonomic dysfunction. Well, why don't we look at that hypertension that way? And it turns out, in my view, the reason why we don't think of it that way is we've been taught that this is a disease and it's caused by eating the wrong things, living your life incorrectly. You eat too much pork, you have too much salt, you don't exercise, you're too fat. Well, why were they interested in hypertension in the first place? I think it's because we doctors are standing there, we watch this guy have a heart attack and die, and we're trying to figure out how can we prevent this horrible thing. So we look for the things that are, seem to be always hanging around. We don't have no idea how heart disease happens at this time. High blood pressure. We start to have these cuffs with manometers. Ooh, the blood pressure is always high. And then we find the cholesterol is always high. Diabetes is frequently there. So we've spent many years making drugs for those things. Now here's the tragedy. When I go see those patients, 3 West C on the weekend that just had a stroke, they're on all these pills. They're taking them. They're compliant. They, want, they don't want to have a stroke, yet they're in there meeting me because they just had a stroke. That's kind of disappointing. Eight years ago when I got fanatic about sleep, I thought, why aren't we putting CPAP masks on all these people's faces? Well, I can tell you it's not that easy to do. Somebody with just had a stroke, they're uncomfortable anyway. So the CPAP device is, a, is an intervention. But what we'd rather have is, why aren't we intervening, find a way to fix the sleep, and then the weird part about this was, once you put the CPAP mask on, why does their blood pressure go down? Because the pulmonologist took this area of CPAP devices, they made up their explanation. Oh, it's more oxygen in the brain. Well, that's simple, and the pulmonologists think that way. They think tubes, bellows, oxygen. But it turns out that, gee, every single one of these drugs that we make for blood pressure, same story, goes into the body, hits a receptor, that receptor's there already. Doesn't that sort of suggest that we have drugs like that in our body normally? And if I can just put a dumb CPAP mask on somebody's face and then two months later they can come off half of their blood pressure medicines and take away their diabetes medicines, something is happening in deep sleep that's making their pancreas make more insulin. Something is happening to make their blood pressure go down. So if you think about this instead as an autonomic dysfunction, it turns out that when you sleep deprive people, the tendency is for the blood pressure to go up. It doesn't really even matter why that is the tendency. I do have one out of probably every hundred where the blood pressure goes down. But as soon as the blood pressure goes off, the first thing we should think is, uh-oh, that person isn't sleeping well. Let's fix the sleep and they won't need these drugs. And the interesting part is I think that that would be more effective in preventing the stroke that happens 20 years later. 
You can actually enlarge this a little bit more and say, okay, if we're making acetylcholine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, those are all affecting these receptors in our neck, how, what our heart does, etc. you can enlarge that a little bit to other organs in the body as well. So it turns out that every single drug that I use in my neurology patients, Topamax for headache, Verapamil for headache, Topamax for seizure, oh, Keppra for seizure, Keppra for headache, Verapamil for vertigo. Now, God didn't make Topamax. I made Topamax. Why would there be Topamax receptors in there? Because we have Topamax-like drugs in our body already. Now, the next question would be, well, how come she doesn't have the right amount of Topamax and she gets headaches from it? It always turns out that the sleep is abnormal in the background. I started thinking this way after the patients who have headaches come back with the CPAP mask and say, you know, it's weird, my headaches are gone and I, I can't believe this, but I'm starting to wake up in the morning with tingling in my hands and feet and I feel really weird. And this is the way I felt when I first started my Topamax. Now, I don't want to take that stuff away because it saved my life. I've been on Topamax for two years. And after a while, I, I started thinking, well, that's interesting. Maybe they're making their own Topamax now while they're in deep sleep and I'm adding Topamax to it. Well, let's take the Topamax away. And I learned over time that you never take away the preventative drug until whatever you're treating is gone and has been gone for a while. And then the patient will tell you, wow, I can't wake up now. Well, maybe it's time for us to lower that clonopin dose at bedtime. Slowly over time, they will, your body will tell you when you don't need the extra medications anymore. That's a totally different concept. And the only reason why I stumbled into that was because the CPAP device is not a drug. And it would be patients that I was sending, oh, I'm sending them because they're tired, but they come back and say, you know what's funny? I've been wearing this mask for three weeks and my tremor's gone. I'm like, what? Your tremor's gone. It's been there for five years. Your tremor's gone. I haven't given you a drug for that. Same thing with burning in the feet. All these things that I would think, that's so weird. These, are, these aren't headache and they aren't sleep apnea. Why, why are they getting better? So it turns out while we're sleeping, we're making hundreds of chemicals that make our body work normally. And what's the interesting part about that is, it's tailor-made for that person. If I've got somebody who started having daily headache at age 15, that means when they were 12, their little head pain switch was not in the on position when they woke up in the morning. Can we go back to that state? If I'm using a drug that looks a lot like a calcium channel stabilizer, gee, maybe they make their own. So it turns out all of these patients who have neurologic illnesses that we think are probably genetically related, they've had that gene since the day they popped out. If you think of it that way, then what you do when they come in at age 75, have a daily headache, have a normal CAT scan, they don't have a brain tumor, and they haven't had any other medicines that have started this headache to happen, probably had migraine. Their mom had migraine, their sister had migraine, they never did, until 75. If you look, they'll have a sleep disorder. As we don't sleep normally, we begin to fail in making all the chemicals that keeps our body in the right state when we wake up. Now the next part is a different concept also. What they say in the literature about why we get tired is we build up these chemicals in our brain that make us tired. I don't really see it that way. I really think that we run out of chemicals. Many of my patients who are just using CPAP or even the ones that are using vitamin D will tell you, you know, in the second month I woke up and my tremor was gone in the morning but it came right back at 10 a.m. And the headache patients told me that consistently. If you ask them to look at that, okay, I want you to pay attention. Do you wake up in the morning without the headache? They will slowly, gradually march through this transition phase where they'll have no headache when they wake up, but it comes at 10. And then three weeks later, they have no headache and it lasts until 2 p.m. And that sort of implies that we're making enough chemical to start off the day with the head pain switch in the off position or the tremor to be gone, and then it runs out. That kind of implies that we all go to sleep after 16 hours because we make enough chemicals to last 16. Now, we'd like to have some in storage because if I have to work nights or I have a baby that's sick, I'd like to be able to stay up one or two nights. But we all know if you try to go more than 24 to 48 hours awake, you're not gonna make it. That means you actually run out of all the chemicals that we use to think and for your body to function. And we all know what it's like to wake up tired in the morning. We all have that as a natural idea of, oh, I just don't feel good, I have to go to sleep again. 
If we enlarge that a little bit to insulin packets, for instance, this is a very different way of thinking about diabetes. It turns out there are hundreds. You know, I, I, the, the one slide that I was going to put in here that I didn't has 350 mitochondrial genome mutations that cause diabetes. Each one of them is different. That means that any way that you can think of to make a cell go haywire, if it affects the islet cell, that islet cell won't do its job, you won't match the insulin to the glucose, and you'll have diabetes. Now, that's an interesting thing because what if I don't know exactly which gene you have? And what if I have no way to treat your mitochondrial genome mutation? All I have is to be able to give you insulin, which is nice, that's a big step forward. But what if you didn't have diabetes until you were 35? You had that gene problem. That implies that you were actually able to deal with it in some way. You make some supportive change, you make a change in the mechanism so that you're actually able to match the amount of insulin for the glucose that you take in. That also means that I should be thinking about the sleep disorders in my diabetics. Even in the childhood onset diabetics, the 13-year-olds who get diabetes because of an autoimmune attack on their islet cells. We know that sleep disorders lead to an increased risk of autoimmune disorders, and I'm going to come around to that at the very end also. If we can tease out a stem cell out of the pancreas and grow it in a petri dish, what's it there for? We, think, we get so proud of ourselves because we, see, we find a stem cell. Well, finding the stem cell should make you think, gee, could the body repair itself? Yeah, but when does it do that? While you're sleeping. If that kid never sleeps normally and they never did, you will never know if those islet cells could come back on their own, but that's what they're there for. I think that we all make enough chemicals to last for about 16 hours. It affects different cells in different ways. Um, I think that high cholesterol is probably one of the same. As soon as we stop sleeping well, just like the blood pressure tends to go up, and I don't know why, the cholesterol tends to go up. Most of the other hormonal systems, it goes down. So all of us in this room know that we watch on television, as soon as the guy has sleep apnea, uh-oh, it's the get it up medicine. He doesn't have the low T medicine. So the people who have sleep disorders who are male have low testosterone. Frequently, the women have low estrogen. That's why they bleed and get their uterus taken out. We have made ways to deal with those medical problems and we say things like, oh yes, we see that in sleep apnea, but wouldn't it be nice to get that whole endocrine system to be working normally again. This is another reason why the women, after they have their babies, get on thyroid medicine commonly. The thyroid is run by the vitamin D also. I tend to want to replace the vitamin D for sleep, but it's not about that. You run the vitamin D up too high, the sleep gets disrupted, everything falls apart, the cholesterol goes right back up again, the thyroid gets out of whack again. So it's really getting the sleep to be normal. So, as we go back and we think about that doctor in the 1930s standing there by the patient wanting to do the right thing to make this heart attack not happen, unfortunately because we all sleep too, we're unconscious and therefore doctors have left it for last. We had no way to really study what was going on inside their people's heads. And the odd part about medicine is my clinical observations in my patients who can talk are valued less than rat experiments which is weird. You know, it wasn't always that way in medicine. Uh, the people who trained me in neurology published articles about three patients. Three patients who had a similar stroke. And you would publish clinical vignettes because that's how you learned about the brain. Oddly enough, in terms of sleep and other things like migraine where there is no visible pathology on the MRI scan, we don't really use clinical observation. We like to have animal models. Animal models of sleep are a little bit different than ha having humans. They can't tell you how they feel in the morning. You can publish papers saying if you sleep deprived rats, you kill them. I mean, slowly over a period of time, they die. But I think that we should also be paying attention to what the patients say about how they feel. So one of the things that's very important if you're going to try to use these techniques that I'm talking about in your patients to get them better or in your family is understanding the time frame. When you put a CPAP mask on someone's face, they don't go home and go, whoopee, tomorrow I'm going to feel great. They go home and go, ooh, 
this is going to be awful. You know, they expect it to take a long time. They expect to struggle. It's a terrible idea. So I learned a lot about the time frame of getting better by getting to sleep better through spending three or four years giving CPAP masks to everyone. And then if you transition, and for the longest time I kept saying, well, you know, if I had a pill, I'd give it to you, and then now I do have a pill. But we think that this pill is going to make us better. It doesn't. So vitamin D is not the cure for everything. It's one of the things that's deficient in most of the people who have sleep disorders. But it turns out if you don't fix the sleep and that's not the only thing wrong, the patient doesn't get better. And then the timing of that is a little bit different. So you have to let the patient and the doctor know what the timing of getting better is. Hypertension comes on slowly over a period of years. Luckily it doesn't take years to take it away again, but it does take months. And sometimes you can take the medicines away, which is really nice. I think we should at least have the open mind to say every single time I add this third antihypertensive, that if we could do something else with the sleep, we might have the opportunity to take it away again. The patients would really love that. You'd also like to be feeling better. So I think CPAP is a wonderful thing. Um, I really feel strongly that unfortunately what you often see is the CPAP is being applied, but the patient's still getting worse. Then we have to go to BiPAP. Now your patient's sitting in a chair. And one of the things that frustrated me when I was using a lot of CPAP devices was I could tell the disease was still getting worse in the background. They were getting more and more paralyzed. I have to put the pressure up higher. That means that the disease of getting too paralyzed while you're in REM sleep is still getting worse. So if possible, and if they have sleep apnea, wear the mask. It will get you better faster. But if you can get them sleeping so they sleep through the night before they have their sleep study and actually have to put the CPAP device on, those CPAP devices don't do anything when you're awake. So if you lay there for three hours in the middle of the night with a CPAP mask on, it's just frustrating. So if you can get them to sleep and then get them to wear the CPAP, that's even better. So the next point is... I become very adamant about getting the vitamin D right because I noticed that it cured the sleep. Now I know an awful lot about it. I still believe in sleep studies. I think they're very important, but the first thing I try to do is figure out if they're deficient. If, if there's a deficiency state that's causing abnormal sleep, that's what I'd like to have treated first. If I can fix that, that would be nice. If I can get the patient sleeping through the night, even if I end up doing a sleep study six months from now and figuring out that they still need a CPAP mask, I think it works better that way. So it's not the D that cures the illnesses. It's very important to realize this. If you, I just had a woman this weekend, her vitamin D level was 90, she came in with a stroke. I'm the only person who's gonna care about that, but I believe strongly that when her level went over 80, I just took away her sleep. I took away her sleep in the same way that it had been taken away for the 15 years prior, because she only started on D two years ago. So it's not that having a D level of 90 is gonna give you a stroke. If you've had 15 years of bad sleep and then you finally get on vitamin D, I just stole your sleep another six months. But it means that if I just played a role in making your sleep worse, maybe I'm playing a role in getting you to have a stroke. That's, that's a bad thing. You must pay attention to the levels. You can't just start anybody on a vitamin D without warning them that too high is just as dangerous as too low because the same things come back when it's too high. It also turns out there are a few people who have secondary B vitamin deficiencies that I believe are linked to the D and we're going to talk about that a little bit. So I give you a lot of things in your handout about exactly what to do. I feel that my patients are now able to tell me, which is something I never expected, they can actually tell when their levels fall below 60 and go over 80. And if I, I just give them the possible idea that when they get a lot better, they're actually gonna be able to tell me when their level is off and then they go in and get a level, it turns out most people can. Um, the sleep disorder that comes back when it's too high is no different than the other one. So um, at the beginning, I usually insist that my patients get levels done anytime they're feeling worse. Anytime that you have a patient that you want to use vitamin D in, as a physician, you should always think about it the way you would thyroid. A patient comes in, they have their hair falling out, they're constipated, they feel awful, they're sensitive to cold, you check their thyroid, you put them on thyroid, you don't say come back whenever you feel like it, come back in three years. You say oh you have to come back in three months or a month and check your thyroid again, make sure we have it right. 
Also, the internists have gotten used to the idea over time that they check it all the time. Every single patient that hits the door in the hospital gets a TSH level. Why? Because it affects all sorts of things. Also affects the sleep. You have to think about vitamin D in that same way. You would never dream of putting someone on a dose of this stuff. It's more complicated even than thyroid because when you go outside, you make some on your skin in the summer. That means anytime you put somebody on a hormone, you want to have a follow-up appointment to check their level and make sure it's okay. Okay, FDA recommended 1,000. The reason why is they know that you can really hurt people with vitamin D. They don't know why. I know why, because I've seen it. I felt it myself and I've done it to my family and my patients, but all they're talking about still is high calcium levels. It's still just as dangerous. This is a very odd mistake that was made in medicine that we would put this hormone in the food. That means the FDA, when they're asked to give a recommendation of a dose, I think they did the right thing. Very smart move on their part. Some of my patients really only need 1,000 a day. That means even though most of us may need 20,000 and to get better, some of my patients, even if you put them on my routine dose, their levels will get too high immediately. That means I think the FDA has done the right thing. However, that does not mean that it has anything to do with what your patient needs. Every single person needs to see what their level is, how much do they need to get their level back where they can sleep normally, and then what will be the maintenance dose. And you can put this together really easily with each patient. You, one month later, you do another level and you figure out which way, did it, which way did it go? Did it go up? Did it go down? Did it stay the same? Everybody who's starting to replace D levels has the same thing to say, boy, I'm really surprised at how much it takes. And that's what it took me six months to figure out. Wow, this is weird. I'm trying to replace this chemical so that these women will sleep better and not have a headache. They don't want to hang around with me for a year waiting for it to get better. So I really pushed the dose a little bit and went through the literature to figure out, okay, what's, what does our body make? Our body makes 20,000. Well, that's what your body is set up to do most of the time. Each person makes this at their own rate based on their skin color, etc. It turns out that the, most of the laboratories, will, most of the insurance companies will pay for this four times a year. I, I really think that there is nothing that's keeping us from getting people's vitamin D levels to where they sleep better. Now, the next part is, the next development, which is, and these are some slides about what are the warnings, don't use D2, don't dose it once a week, don't do things that are not physiologic. Yes, we do store this, but our body never makes 50,000 in a day. Okay, now the next exciting part is, I happened to stumble into vitamin D, not because I cared about vitamins at all, but because I was very passionate about sleep. I could see these people getting better with a CPAP mask, and then one of my 18-year-olds had a very, very low B12, and I thought, wow, maybe the brain knows what to do, but it doesn't have this vitamin that it needs to really carry out its... So I already figured out that this gal who had no deep sleep, she recorded 10 hours, no deep sleep. She had a terribly low B12, 178. So then I start doing B12s on everybody, and then by weird accident, I ended up with the vitamin D. So it turns out that I know that B12 affects the sleep because everybody that I put on the B12 shots would come back and say the same thing. I get two good nights of sleep and 28 bad ones. So B12 affects the sleep. I have no idea what the mechanism is, but anybody who's B12 deficient, they take a shot or a pill and they go, wow, I felt like I had so much more energy. The problem is it doesn't last. If you don't fix the D, then the B12 kind of wears off over a period of months. Now, it turns out that the D is always low behind the B12 and that there's an actual connection between those two. The D runs the parietal cells. The parietal cells make acid in the stomach. They also make intrinsic factor. So when we're in the hibernation phase and we don't have very high Ds, then we also don't make very much stomach acid. We all feel like we have a lot because our sphincters get weak as well. It was designed to be in a circumstance where we wouldn't be eating. So we take away all the energy we want to expend on eating because we supposedly are not eating during the winter. Now that turns out to give a lot of us reflux, but it also, in the patient who's been D-low for over 10 years, they have an increased risk of the B12 being low. You have to add that in order to see the sleep get better. Now. These are the things I want you to do. I'm giving you some things to look over, but I want to tell you some of the newer things that I've seen that I think mean uh, we can actually get patients completely better. Because one of the, the difficult parts for me has been, these are the medicines that I also pay attention to. If you go through the rat literature, what you'll find is they 
take away REM sleep in rats by using clonidine. Well, as soon as I saw that, I went, wow, what about those clonidine patches? Why don't we always give it at bedtime? So the people who get better, they have no headache, they're not on any sleep medicine, they figure out this D stuff, they don't come back. So now I have a practice full of people that I haven't succeeded in. Very frustrating. Their sleep is not good, therefore their headaches aren't any better, their back pain is still there, and I'm left puzzling why, what does their brain want that I'm not giving them? I know about three things, but that's all I know about. And these are the things that have been building up over the last year or so. Why do some of my daily headache sufferers now have burning in their hands and feet? They didn't have that before. Am I somehow causing that? And this is interesting that it's happening in the third year of, of treating them with vitamin D. Why is it the patients with burning in their hands and feet that I thought would get better when we treated their sleep, not all of them get better? And I, and I thought that because a lot of them have relatives with burning and uh, a lot of them didn't get better. And some of them got better with a CPAP device, but I can't get them completely better. Why do some of the vitamin D patients have pain and some don't? They both have a vitamin D level of 15, they both sleep badly. Some of them have terrible pain and some don't, and I, that's been puzzling me. Why can't I get them all better? Why is it that everybody with irritable bowel didn't get better? I, you know, it was there so often in my daily headache suffers that I thought, oh, the irritable bowel has to get better. There are articles saying that we take our vitamin D off our skin, it goes to our liver, it's in the bile, we pass it down to our colonic bacteria, and our colonic bacteria use our vitamin D. They're in the dark there, so they have to use ours. So I thought, oh, great, we're gonna give back vitamin D, all the irritable bowel will go away. No, it didn't work. And that was very frustrating to me. The reflux went away, okay? Now that was interesting, but the irritable bowel is often still there. Sometimes they still have diarrhea, they still have constipation. So what is it that their brain wants? Okay, now, this will strike you as surprising, but I don't care a whit about vitamins. So my patients constantly are telling me things about this, that, and the other supplement, vitamins, high colonics, all this stuff that I don't care about. And I try not to be arrogant about it because I realize that most people think I'm crazy too because I babble about vitamin D all the time. And one of my patients in the summer brings me this book that she's really proud of and she says, you're gonna really like this book. And it's about this B vitamin and curing rheumatoid arthritis. And I say, oh yeah, I'll, of course I'll, I'll try not to be the, my usual arrogant, narrow-minded doctor self and of course I'll read it. And then of course I don't. I leave it there for two months and I just like do the eye roll thing. Oh, why do they always think I'm so interested in vitamins? Well, she's about to come back and I don't wanna offend her. She's been with me for like two years. So I read the book and about midway through, this woman who is a lay person is talking about how she got better when she took this pentothenic acid. She's giving it to her friends and she's giving vignettes like a self-help book. But then about midway through she says, and frequently they mention that their sleep gets better. And all of a sudden I went, oh, ooh, now that interests me a lot because I know there's still something missing in me and some of my patients and I'm not giving B vitamins because I hate vitamins. I hate taking them. I really don't like giving people more than one thing. It doesn't seem scientific to me. And so I pull the references that she's referring to and the references are from the 1950s about giving liquid diets to convicts with, with feeding tubes. Now those of you who are actually born in the 1950s know there were no feeding tubes back then, okay? This is a very unusual set of experiments. They actually created a totally liquid diet because you can't take the B5 out of a diet just by changing the food because all the Bs come together. They all clump together except for B12. They usually come together in the same sources. So there's this laboratory that's doing these experiments trying to make the diet just deficient in pantothenic acid. They've done it in pigs, they've done it in other animals by changing their feed and the pigs would walk in this really funny way and they died of adrenal hemorrhage, they died of adrenal failure. So they do it in convicts and two weeks later they complain they can't sleep, their belly's all bloated and they have burning in their hands and feet. And all of a sudden I think, wow, this could be really cool if this turned out to be the thing. Well the weird part about this is I think, I don't like to take vitamins myself and why on earth if they have good diets. You know, the, the, the one particular woman that has the worst burning in my practice lives on a farm, she makes all her own food, she eats a wonderful diet. Why would she be B vitamin deficient? So I start reading about pantothenic acid, and it turns out we make these bees in our poop bacteria. And I never knew that. How come nobody taught me that? It turns out seven out of eight of them, including actually B12, are made by our intestinal bacteria, and then we absorb them. So that every single person has a diet source, and a poop source. And it's very difficult to figure out how much comes from each. Now, here's the other weird stuff. 
So I'm sitting there babbling to my poor husband who has to listen to this every day. And I say, honey, maybe this is why your belly hurts now that you've been on the vitamin D. You know, he never had irritable bowel before. Now he does. And I think maybe this pantothenic acid. And did you know that we make this stuff in our poop bacteria? And he says, that's weird. I'm reading this Economist magazine and here's this whole science article about how everybody who has hypertension, heart disease, high cholesterol, and diabetes has abnormal poop bacteria. And I think, that's weird. So I read this article. It's fascinating. I have it up front for you if you're interested. It's a science, it's not a science journal, but it's a science editor talking about the fact that medicine is now moving in a direction that says, gee, for 100 years we've been trying to kill these bacteria. Are there bacteria that live on or inside us that do important things for us? And it turns out, yes. So they have this whole area that talks about microbiomes. And that these two groups of patients, basically all the people I know have low vitamin D and sleep disorders, all the autoimmune disorders, including things like colon cancer, and all the people who have the chronic illnesses that you and I treat all the time, oh, they also have abnormal colonic biomes. Now, nobody knows why. Okay, I happen to know that it's probably because their vitamin D is too low, because that was the original thing. So does that mean if you have sleep apnea, you have abnormal poop? Well, it turns out to be yes, oddly enough, and it gets me into a whole area that I have no interest in, except it turns out if you have a perfect D level and you have back pain still, and I give you B50, in two days the back pain goes away, like magic. It was amazing. Now, this is not something you're going to see in somebody who just tries to get vitamins, okay? And there are several other things that happen. One, if you give it to somebody who's not deficient in the Bs, they get really sick. They get all agitated and feel like they can't sleep and they feel really weird. So one, the B vitamins, although we think that they're benign and we go into Walmart and buy them, and I was using even bigger doses, my restless legs became horrible within a day of taking big doses of pantothenic acid by itself. So one, you have to be careful with the dosing of these. Two, if you're asking about the sleep, you'll get different answers than if you're not. And it turns out that if you're deficient and you can't measure that because pantothenic acid is theoretically doesn't exist as a deficiency state, according to all the recent articles, you can't measure it commercially. So I was stuck with, here, let's try this and see what happens. But now I've had enough time. I started this in August and made a few wrong turns with the dosing. But pretty much most of the patients who need it, they feel better immediately, within two days. Their sleep starts to get better. And these will only be the people who have really been deficient a long time. But most of the people who come in who are really had a little few headaches for the last two years. They, aren't, they haven't had these secondary deficiencies happen to them. So now I'm picking, I'm trying to choose who is it that really needs this. And it turns out I had this theory that was, well, if we have this abnormal poop bacteria and we don't usually eat poop, you know, like one of the th conversations I would have with the patients every day, I give them this article and I say, if you get to the end of this article, you'll see that there are guys in Oklahoma who are taking poop from one person and giving it as an enema to another person. Uh, yeah, that's what we all did. Ooh, <laughs> I'm not doing that. You know, I'd have to be dying before I would let them do that. I'd have to be unconscious. Well, we just spent the 100 years telling people not to mess with other people's poop. Well, then, then the second thing he t says is, if you look at three months old microbiomes throughout the world, what you'll find is the following. They have these enzymes that are made by the bacteria that break down glycans in mom's milk. Well, that helps their nutrition. Well, then the next question would be, wait a minute, I'm taking probiotic bacteria. They make it white so I won't be grossed out, but basically I'm eating poop. now. Did we feed that kid poop? No. Here's a three month old that, that popped out sterile and three months later has the perfect colonic biome. There's something wrong with this picture. The doctors are always so concrete. Ooh, the right guys aren't in there. We have to give them back. Well, I just gave vitamin D for three years. That means it's not, the vitamin D by itself is not correcting the problem because my patients still have irritable bowel. So all of a sudden I think, well, let's just say that these four species are there together because one of them makes a bee that the other three can't make, and this one makes a bee that the other three can't make. So if they're all lying on top of each other and thriving, they have all the bees that they all need. They're not making them because they like us. They're making them because that helps them grow. But then that might suggest that I have to add back these bees so there's so many of these bees down in that soup with the D that they can grow.
So it's a theory. I had no idea if it was going to happen right, but it turns out it works great. So if you take somebody with everything's fixed, except they still can't sleep and, and they have irritable bowel, and you add this B50 stuff, it works great. Now the problem is, if you take it too long, all the stuff comes back. So I had this theory, now what's going to happen if really I'm right that the poop bacteria come back? And I have had a few patients who come back and say, I have been constipated since as far as I can remember. You know, 38 year olds who are, have been constipated forever who are now actually having normal bowel movements. And that, so that makes me suspect that I'm moving in the right direction. But it turns out if you take it a little too long, all of a sudden I think the poop bacteria are making your supply and you're taking an extra supply and then the pain comes back. So you have to do it just for a brief period of time. So here's what I'm doing with it now. Be careful with it. But it looks like about three months into it, the sleep goes goofy again, and then you have to stop it. And I've had several patients now come back. I didn't tell them this at the beginning. They just said, look, I felt so much better when I started that stuff. And then about three months later, you know, my sleep got goofed up again, and I stopped it, and it went away. So I think this is something we only have to do in the sickest patients. It's probably going to mean that this is related to the vitamin D deficiency epidemic. So this probably means that there was really one epidemic. So we're adding this B50, but it's actually related to the fact that there were vitamin D deficient in the first place, okay? So one, we've got this D that goes low. Then when it stays low for a while, then the B12 goes low. That affects the sleep. Iron does the same. And then it turns out there are these other B vitamins that we all think, oh, I'm getting a great diet. I don't need them. Well, if you just lost half of your supply, the patients who had daily headache, who got the burning in their hands and feet, two days after B50, completely gone. So it works really fast in the person who's really deficient. Now it's interesting that the diabetes will frequently be there too. Not always. A lot of patients who end up seeing me for burning in their feet, they don't have diabetes. You give them this, diet, uh, burning goes away right away. Be careful that you don't stay on it too long. Now, perhaps this D is the first, and then there's this trickle-down effect in some. Most of the patients that I wind up seeing in the hospital, they've got all of this stuff. They're a wreck, okay? They have anemia, they have renal disease, they have diabetes, they have hypertension. They have every single one of these deficiencies. And now, when I see the patient who's complaining of burning in her hands and feet that's only been there for the last two months, I can kind of go, I know what's wrong with you. How long ago did you stop have, you know, have normal sleep? Oh, I think my youngest is 25 now, so I've had bad sleep for 25 years, really. They don't get these secondary deficiencies until they've really been D-deficient a very, very long time. And here's something I found last night that I think is really interesting. There's still a bunch of symptoms that I'll see in my really, really sick patients I don't have any explanation for. Swelling in the feet. Uh, that, but here's what I look up last night. I'm looking through all the symptoms of B vitamin deficiency. Berry, berry. Thiamine deficiency. I don't look for this. I mean, we look for this in alcoholics and we hang the yellow bag, right? Here are the symptoms of beriberi. Weight loss, emotional disturbances, weakness and pain in the limbs, periods of irregular heartbeat, foot edema, heart failure. Gee, do I have 35-year-olds with that? Yeah. I have 35-year-olds that have an ejection fraction of 35%. They have swelling in their feet and they say, oh, right atrium enlargement. Gee, we see that. So what this does to me is, gee, could we be having these deficiency states that I learned about in medical school that I've since forgotten about in really a different setting because of this abnormal poop bacteria. Weird idea, I have no idea if it's right, but once you re start to look at these articles, you'll see this stuff popping up all over the place that our poop bacteria plays a large role in our health. It is absolutely related to the autoimmune diseases. The article that I have for you, if you want it in the front from The Economist, has a, an excellent discussion of why it is that the the white blood cells that are on the front line, which turns out to be the lining of the, of the colon, do a, do a lot of the recognition of normal and abnormal bacteria and, and decide whether or not to attack certain proteins. So those guys play a huge role in autoimmune diseases like MS, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. So it turns out you get your poop bacteria right, you may actually have a lower incidence of a lot of the autoimmune diseases that we see. So remember that this last part is totally my fantasy. 
I'm giving it to you as my new idea. I'm very happy about it because my pain is gone, although I still have restless legs, and my patients are doing a lot better. So I'm thinking that I'm getting closer to actually being able to treat the sleep completely without the CPAP device, which is a very, very happy thought for me. And I'll end with that and my grandbaby. Thank you. <laughs>